So Guillain-Barre syndrome is a disease, an acute disease of the uh, peripheral nervous system. And it is an idiopathic, demyelinating, autoimmune, inflammatory, symmetrical, ascending polyneuropathy. So how is that for adjectives? So it's idiopathic in as much as we don't know exactly what causes it. We do know that it is often followed by an infection. A lot of times, though, the patient doesn't remember the infection, so that isn't necessarily useful. But it is often followed by an infection. 25% of cases, it's estimated, are followed by uh, a diarrheal infection. It's demyelinating uh, and autoimmune, so uh, that means that there are antibodies created that attack the myelin sheath of uh, the peripheral nerves. And of course, it's inflammatory. Anytime we have an autoimmune disease going on that's attacking parts of the body, that's an inflammatory process. And it's symmetrical, meaning that we're going to have symptoms on both sides. And it is, most importantly, ascending. And that's going to be what really sets this apart and what helps you determine that this is Guillain-Barre syndrome more likely uh, than some of the other uh, neuropathies or, uh, or uh, motor synapse disorders. So in Guillain-Barre syndrome, there's both motor and sensory symptoms, and this sets it apart from things like myasthenia gravis and LEMS. Uh, in which you only have motor symptoms. So Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, the motor symptoms are most prevalent, but you can have some paresthesias uh, involved as well. And there can be some autonomic instability uh, due to uh, the effect on the vagal nerve. So classically, Guillain-Barre syndrome affects the lower limbs. It usually starts in the feet and then it ascends upwards. Uh, there, uh, the lower extremities are affected more than the upper extremities, and the feet usually start before the legs. And the progression is pretty quickly. It's over hours to days. So usually a patient will start out saying they've got tingling or uh, your classic paresthesias of the feet. That then progresses to weakness of the legs to the point where they would note that they can't get out of a chair and then ultimately it affects their ability to walk. Now Guillain-Barre syndrome, even though it sounds really, really bad, is actually rare and it's not really deadly. So the incidence is one to three per 100,000 in the US per year, so that's quite rare. And most patients will make a relatively full recovery, and by full recovery I mean that they will return to functional uh, status. They'll be able to function uh, just as much as they were able to beforehand. They won't have any lasting occupational uh, deficits. Um, that's most patients. Uh, about one-third of patients, though, after three years do note some residual uh, uh, neurological deficits. 2 to 12 percent of patients will die from the complications, but usually these are patients who are already pretty sick to begin with. And like I mentioned, it's usually linked to an infectious onset, particularly the uh, diarrheal illness caused from Campylobacter, uh, but it has been linked to other pathogens, uh, lots of other pathogens. There's uh, an increased risk with CMV and herpes, uh, Lyme's disease, leprosy, not that we see that in the U.S., uh, as well as uh, HIV. So here's a little illustration of, uh, of Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is, I didn't make this, uh, but uh, you can find this online. So risk factors, as mentioned, possibly autoimmune. Usually it happens in younger adults. And there is, sometimes they, there is word around that it's associated with certain vaccines. That is true. However, most of the vaccines that are given uh, out today have a very, very, very low association with Guillain-Barre. You're far more likely to get Guillain-Barre from uh, an infectious cause. Um, and then it uh, progresses over a few weeks. There's minimal muscular atrophy, just simply, even though this is a lower motor neuron disorder, it's simply because it doesn't last very long. You're not going to get the atrophy that you would see in other lower motor neuron disorders like ALS.
And this is a symmetrical disorder, and that makes sense because this is autoimmune, so the problem is in your blood, and so it's going to be on either side. Most of the time, it starts on the lower extremities, and when I say most of the time, I mean pretty much all of the time. There are variants of Guillain-Barre syndrome, most notably the, uh, quote, Miller-Fisher variant, and that is uh, associated with more uh, bulbar and facial uh, disorders that would affect talking and swallowing. Most patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome will have the lower extremity weakness. They can also have bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, and then this can ultimately progress to what we try to prevent, and that is the diaphragmatic complications, which would uh, require ICU hospitalization. Okay. So the history for Guillain-Barre syndrome patients, often the patient will have some kind of recent infection within the last month. A lot of times it's diarrheal, but it can sometimes involve the upper respiratory tract or it can be herpes or it can be HIV. And not all patients are going to remember the infection. So you can't really rely on the infection. Uh, you certainly can't use the absence of an infection to rule out Guillain-Barre syndrome. However, if the patient has had an infection, particularly a diarrheal infection, within the last month, that increases the probability that it's Guillain-Barre syndrome. The symptoms, as mentioned, are going to be this ascending weakness or neuropathic symptoms, which are described as the same thing you would have in diabetic neuropathy, the sort of... Uh, uh, pins and needles, tingling pain. Uh, it can be described as pain, but most often it's described as weakness. And it starts in the feet and works its way up to the legs. There can be facial, bulbar, or upper extremity symptoms, but that is less common. And I would imagine on the USMLE, if they're giving you a question on Guillain-Barre syndrome, they're going to involve the legs rather than the upper extremities, just because that's a uh, less common presentation. Ultimately, though, the symptoms can and do progress to the diaphragm. So any patient who has Guillain-Barre syndrome, if it's confirmed, these are patients that need to be hospitalized because we need to monitor their progress. Acute weakness or paresthesias that are localized to the legs should always arouse suspicion of Guillain-Barre syndrome. If you have weakness and paresthesias of both legs, but not so much of your upper extremities, that's really, that really should make you think of Guillain-Barre, simply because there are very few things that cause that anymore in the U.S., on physical exam, you're going to see weakness of the lower extremities. Because this affects larger nerves and it's demyelinating, it causes loss of deep, deep tendon reflexes. So you'll have a, uh, a loss of your knee reflexes, but you won't have loss of other reflexes in the upper extremities because that tends to not be affected as much. So how do we diagnose Guillain-Barre syndrome? Well, first off, we should remember what it's not. And what do we not see in Guillain-Barre syndrome? Uh, we generally do not see any kind of constitutional uh, symptoms or fever. From time to time, you can see incontinence, but incontinence should alert you more towards a nerve root disorder or a spinal cord disorder rather than Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, routine labs should also be normal, so you should have a normal CBC, you should have normal chemistries, so generally, these patients uh, on, on labs and uh, on physical, except for the weakness, they appear to be normal. If you suspect Guillain-Barre syndrome, if you can't rule it out, then the best initial diagnostic step is going to be a lumbar puncture to get a CSF analysis. That sounds like a rather invasive uh, test for a first step, but Guillain-Barre syndrome, if left untreated, can be a very, very serious uh, deadly disorder. So we want to go uh, and, and get this diagnosed as quickly as possible. And with the treatment that we have available, it's not effective if the symptoms have been going on for more than two weeks. So we want to diagnose this as quickly as possible. So we get a lumbar puncture and analyze the CSF. And the classic finding on CSF, and you're not going to see this in any other disorder, is what's called an albuminocytologic dissociation. Albumin meaning protein, cytologic meaning cells. So you have this dissociation in that you have elevated protein, 
albumin, but no cells. And when do we usually see elevated protein and elevated cells? We see that in uh, things like meningitis. So this is different in that you have a high protein, but you don't have any cells that would be indicative of a meningitis. So a, a, an isolated elevated protein is the classic finding for GBS. Albuminocytologic dissociation. That's the technical shop word. Elevated protein, but no cells. Once you've made that finding, it may be prudent to get a confirmatory test with an electromyelogram, EMG, or nerve conduction studies. But the most accurate test is an EMG. So what is the differential for Guillain-Barre syndrome? I tried to organize these in order of uh, how common they are in the U.S., but it's kind of difficult to, I'm, I'm not really going off of any hard statistics. I'm kind of also going off of how common they are on the USMLE. So vitamin B12 deficiency can cause paresthesias of the feet. Uh, so that should always be something that you consider in your differential, particularly if it's a patient who may be malnourished, if it's a patient who is an alcoholic. Uh, vitamin B12 levels can be part of your initial laboratory workup, but a, a normal vitamin B12 level uh, would, would uh, definitely outrule vitamin B12 deficiency. Another thing you would see in vitamin B12 deficiency, of course, is your, uh, your uh, macro... Uh, hemo, uh, macro uh, cytologic uh, anemia. Uh, spinal cord injuries and spinal cord compression would usually give yield to a, uh, a more uh, unilateral symptomology. So if you have unilateral symptoms, Guillain-Barre is less, it's probably not likely, but uh, if you have unilateral symptoms, the best next step would uh, more than likely be to get a CT or an MRI. Nerve root compression uh, comes in with that. And then of course we have conversion disorder, which is always a possibility in pretty much anything. West Nile disease and tick paralysis are not so common, uh, but this is where the absence of constitutional symptoms come in with West Nile disease and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. You're going to have a rash, you're gonna have fever, um, you're going to have an array of other symptoms in addition to the weakness and paralysis. And then poliomyelitis has been pretty much eradicated with the polio vaccine, but I mean, it's, it, it is there. So um, I guess I, I couldn't in good faith not include it on a differential. But the big one to think of is a vitamin B12 deficiency, and uh, you're going to see a, uh, a, a, uh, an anemia with an elevated MCV. Okay, so as mentioned, diagnosis, first step is to get a CSF analysis where you're going to see an elevated protein but uh, no cells. Most accurate test is EMG and nerve conduction studies. Once the patient has been diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, the patient needs to be admitted to the hospital for observation and treatment. Okay, without exception, all patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome need to be admitted for treatment. And the initial therapy and the best therapy is plasma exchange or IVIG. Either or, but you don't do both. Okay, you, there, there's no efficacy to doing plasma exchange and IVIG. So one or the other. They're both equally effective. You do not use steroids. Steroids considering that this is an autoimmune disorder, is a likely wrong answer on the USMLE uh, because a lot of people think autoimmune, knee-jerk, steroids. And you cannot use steroids for Guillain-Barre syndrome. They're not effective. So plasma exchange or IVIG. And we also monitor while they're in the hospital, monitor at least daily, maybe even more frequently depending on the progression of their disease, we monitor their vital capacity. And their vital capacity will tell us about uh, their diaphragmatic involvement, if there is any. So if the vital capacity drops below 15 milligrams per kilogram, depending on the patient's weight, of course, or below one liter, then that represents diaphragmatic involvement. And in that case, you need to transfer them to the ICU. And they're likely, uh, almost certainly, going to need intubation. Okay. So if they're in the hospital, what are we going to be doing for them? 
Most important, we're going to be giving them their treatment with IVIG or plasma exchange. So I don't have that included on here. That's your first step in therapy. While they're in the hospital, after you've treated them, you're going to monitor them with daily or more frequent pulmonary function monitoring, primarily looking at that vital capacity. Magic number is 15 milligrams per kilogram or lower, or one liter or lower. You're going to be keeping an eye on their vitals because there is some autonomic instability associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. It can affect the nerves that feed the heart. So uh, hypotension, is possible and generally if the patient has a mild hypotension uh, we can treat that with fluids alone. Cardiac telemetry is good to have these patients on even if they're uh, on a uh, just an intermediate or a general unit simply because there is an increased risk of arrhythmia uh, and um, we don't need to put them on any prophylactic management for the arrhythmia just monitor their uh, their EKG. And then DVT prophylaxis is going to be necessary with these patients as in any kind of immobile or post-surgical patient, so we'll give them subcutaneous Lovenox or enoxaparin. Of course, you can use uh, heparin or any low molecular weight heparin. Enoxaparin tends to be the choice at most hospitals. Narcotics should be avoided simply because with the autonomic instability, uh, there also tends to be ileus involved too because you have less uh, vagal input to your intestines. Uh, so we try to avoid narcotics to avoid constipation. Pain should be managed with anti-epileptic medication, anticonvulsants such as carbamazepine or gabapentin or similar agents. And of course, neurology should either be at least consulted or uh, actually managing the patient's GBS. After the hospital, once they're discharged, which usually is going to be based on uh, the neurologist's opinion and the patient's overall strength and stability, the recovery period is going to vary. So uh, not all patients are alike, but most patients do recover within a few months. Uh, that's, of course, going to vary based on the patient and their other comorbidities. 80 to 90% of patients will make a dramatic recovery, and most patients will uh, return to their uh, regular daily function. However, some physical therapy can be useful depending on how long their, sympt or their, their, uh, their symptoms went on for uh, because the longer you're not moving, the weaker your muscles get. And so physical therapy can be useful to hasten their return to daily function.